Up today, we're going to be speaking with A.C. Eggleston Bracey, who is the president of Unilever USA and the CEO of North American Personal Care at Unilever. A.C. was also recently named Marketer of the Year by the Advertising Club of New York in 2022. A.C., great to see you. Thanks so much for joining today. Ah, oh, thank you for having me. Happy to be here. Likewise, it's great. This is going to be a great episode. And as I was looking at your background, one thing that definitely stuck out to me, and you've had such an amazing career, is that you were previously on the path very early on to becoming a biomedical engineer while at Dartmouth. Why the change of heart? How did you go from there to being in the seat that you're in today? It's so funny. You just never know what's going to happen in life. Uh, so first, the question is, how did I even decide I wanted to do biomedical engineering? Uh, my father was a math teacher. And my mother was an attorney, and I knew I did not want to do what my mother was doing. Thick, thick, thick books all the time studying the law. Uh, and she went to law school when I was between three and five and six years old, so I remember that. And I love solving math problems, and I think I got that from my dad. But I knew I didn't want to be a teacher, and I loved people. And I like to be challenged, so I just decided, I read somewhere, that I wanted to be an MD, PhD in biomedical engineering. Why? People, being a doctor, math, and an applied way of using the math, engineering, uh, MD, PhD, stretching, and I just decided I wanted to do that, and I knew nothing about it. Like, what is that really? And so I went to school. I had a sense that I didn't want to just do technical work because I liked people. So I went to Dartmouth College, and I got a Bachelor of Arts degree in Engineering Sciences while taking a number of pre-medical courses. And along the way, I did some internships. And I realized I did not like being in the lab. I liked the pencil and paperwork, but I much preferred you know, working with people, working with teams. Um, and so I said biomedical engineering was not for me. I needed to take a break. I went to an informational session about brand management, and I got super excited. It was about people learning what made them tick, about problem solving, working with teams. I was president of my sorority and started a number of clubs on campus, and I thought, oh, that would be fun to take a break. I didn't think it would be a full career, just something fun to do. Right. And so, you know, in 91, I started in uh, brand management, and now I've been uh, a CPG executive for over 30 years. You just never know. Amazing. Yeah, and you didn't just start. You started at P&G, which is obviously sort of the be-all, end-all for uh, brand management, especially for people early in their career. In fact, one common theme we've had at the Speed of Culture podcast is that so many guests have had a stint at various lengths at P&G. Um, what is it about P&G that you think helped prepare you from where you for where you are today, like what are some of the things that you've learned and some of the things that PNG does differently that makes them such an excellent breeding ground for for talent? Well, you know, I was there 25 years, <laughs> so definitely it was more than a stint. Yeah. I think a couple of things about PNG, it's often viewed as a great place to start and not a great place to stay because it's known for like on the ground training. You learn by doing, and it's up or out. So it attracts people that like constant advancement. You know, right. when I do my assessments and what my strong suits are, there's something called strength finders, and number one for me is achiever. So I like to achieve, and I think the culture of P&G kind of breeds that, and so it creates a group of people that, like, I'm advancing or I'm out. And I love that, and that was one of the things that attracted me. Uh, to P&G, and it gives you opportunities. I was an engineering major straight out of undergrad. I knew nothing about business, but I had the opportunity to learn. You know, without an MBA, I went to P&G. So I had the opportunity to learn, again, while doing. And so I think that is something that um, you know, is treasured, and I think that's what makes it a place that attracts a lot of uh, people that you now see as senior executives because it kind of profiles this achiever mindset. It gives you the opportunity. Right. Of course, it has so many of the big brands in the world, and you learn a lot, and you're able to do a lot. Absolutely, and, and you definitely did a lot while you are there. I saw that you were also the youngest GM ever 
in the history of, of um, P&G. I think that you look at people right now trying to get ahead in their careers. Um, what I find is sometimes you have people with a sense of entitlement. They, they expect to be promoted quickly, but the reality is you have to earn it. You obviously dove in and, and, and it must have done something different than other people that made you advance so quickly in an environment like that. Like, what advice would you give to other people starting off in their career so they can kind of get on the fast track coming out of the gate, so to speak? Yeah, I'd say a big part of it was luck. <laughs> really? You know, Interesting. you were in the stars. Are you just being modest? <laughs> I, I probably, but I do think a, a lot of it was luck. But the other thing I would say in terms of advice to people that I really believe today um, is you have to know yourself, be yourself, and then share yourself with others. Because you know, I started at P&G but it was a few years into it where I really flourished. And that's when I had that aha moment that was like, ah, this is who I am and the confidence to be myself. Um, so and I'll let me give you some examples because that can Please. sound like a cliche. You know, I joined, uh, I started you know, as an engineer and I, and, and I joined a company that was a good culture fit. When I say as an engineer, I was very analytical and the company valued data. It wasn't subjective, it was data. And that was a fit right. because, you know, at one plus one equals two. Here are the facts with the data. Our industry and marketing would be highly subjective. That was not a company that was a lot of subjectivity. It was fact-based. Yeah. It was learning how to influence with data. So that was first the culture fit. And so I played that. You know, I used that to my advantage, but that's what the culture expected. Then I realized as I was doing that, I was doing what everybody else is doing. You know, I was good at it, right? I could contribute, and so I was, you know, sure. did well for a couple of years. But then I realized I was doing what everyone else is doing, and I really wasn't being myself at work. I thought who I was personally was different than who I needed to be at business. You know, I was young. I uh, skipped a grade in school, so I started working when I was like 20 or something in my first job with a lot of MBA, so I started young. And so I felt like I had to put on the suit and put on the face and to put on the mask to come in every day. And particularly as a black woman, you know, I had a permed bob and I wore this little neutral suit and I had these little plain glasses and I just got to have my head down and I was cranking out the numbers, doing my analysis. You know, I did a few things that stood out, did some creative stuff, but I wasn't like, you know, really giving all that I could give. And I went to this training session once and they were talking about how junior women in an organization couldn't really relate to senior women in an organization. And it's because the junior women, the new hires, were finding the senior women to be almost um, more male-like than their counterparts. And the trainer was saying, um, that's because there's so few of them, they have to change to survive. So it's not the fault of these women, it's the organization. And why it's so important, if you believe in diversity to drive organization change, you have to give yourself to the organization. And I remember thinking, those, those senior women shouldn't do that. And I was like, oh my God, I'm doing that. <laughs> I'm letting everyone think I'm just like them. And I'm like, and, and in that moment, like, I decided to make a change. And I did within six weeks. I had cut off my perm, stopped straightening my hair. I wore a short natural. I went out, went out and bought this uh, convertible red Porsche. It was like used. It was no money. But it was flashy. Right. I would have never done. Instead of going out for the shoe shines with the boys, I would say, I'm going to get a manicure for lunch. And, you know, like, what does that have to do with the workplace? It was like everything. I did that because I was such a diversity advocate. And I thought the, it, the, that... If the company was going to embrace diversity, it needed to start with me. It wasn't anyone else's job to start it with me. And the gift I got from that, it wasn't about me helping myself. It was about me helping the company. And the right. gift I got from that was like a spree. It was amazing. I was so much more of myself. And that's where my career really started taking off. That was not the goal. But I was so much more comfortable in my own skin, and I got to practice that. It was really uncomfortable for the first couple of months because I felt vulnerable, exposed, like I'd been hiding. So that's in the be yourself. Like, but it is in knowing myself that I was able to be myself. Like, what were the things that made me tick? And I was being more of that. And as an engineer, what I discovered is I really like creativity. 
I really like coming up with new concepts and coming out of that, you know, was creating Febreze. Coming out of that, bringing more of that, let me call it the left brain over the right brain and knowing that. And then being comfortable sharing my talents, my desires, you know, even some of my soft spots with others who are more senior to me that had more experience that could guide me to maybe AC, you should try this. Or yeah, I remember when I moved from working in soap, soap is what was called um, laundry detergents, household cleaning products, into beauty. I, I didn't ask for that. It was someone who knew that I had a personal passion, that I might be a good fit for that. I never asked to get moved to the beauty business. And they moved me to the beauty business, which is where I've really cut my teeth. And that was sharing myself with others. So that's an example of know yourself, be yourself, share yourself with others. And that really made, in my opinion, the difference <laughs> in my, um, you know, at my advancement in my career. I also love what, one of the things I extracted from what you just talked about was just be the change that you want to see. So instead of trying to let the change happen to you, if it, you start, it starts with you. And I think it's such a great message because you really can't rely on anybody else. But if you start, if you, if you have the discipline to make that happen, sooner or later, you know, people start to gravitate towards it. And that's, how, that's really about leadership, isn't it? Yeah, it's like how can I be a champion for diversity if I'm hiding myself? Right. So first, right. the idea is first it starts with you. Look at yourself. First starts with you. What can you do? And that's, that's one right. of my core values is responsibility, being responsible, taking ownership. So, so thank you for that, Matt. Absolutely. And so you talked about beauty and how you really cut your teeth there. And one of the projects you worked on, which is fascinating to me, is that at PNG you led the merger of Cody and PNG Specialty Beauty Business. What was that process like for you, leading such a large scale merger? What was the role you played, and kind of what did you take out of that experience? Yeah, so I had spent a lot of years in uh, beauty and primarily leading the makeup business. And then, um, yeah, and leading the makeup business, I was actually a real proponent of um, P&G selling the makeup business because makeup is a business you can't have as a hobby. It has to be right. your profession. It was sort of an outlier to the rest of their brand portfolio, right? It was an outlier. And so a number of yep. people felt like, oh, why are we being divested? And I was so committed to the business. I, my, my, my excitement and enthusiasm was for the ability to unlock even more growth by being more focused and dedicated. So it was out of that that I was really lucky uh, after leading the makeup business to have been selected in what was called the president designee to run the consumer beauty business for Cody at the time, which included th this merger that was a merger of equals, which was formally P&G's makeup business, brands like CoverGirl and Max Factor merged with Cody's businesses like Rimmel and several others, Sally Hansen and several others. And so I was selected to lead that um, joint makeup business plus uh, hair color business, Clairol, et cetera, and then some of the body business, which was like Adidas deodorants and fragrances. And this is a quite big portfolio and it was incredible because there were two companies formerly P&G and Legacy Cody, that were coming together to create a new company. At the time, it was called the New Cody. And it was creating a whole new culture, extracting the best of what P&G had to offer, the best of what Legacy Cody had to offer, and then this third culture that would be even more performance-driven, even more innovative, even more agile. And having the opportunity as that president-designee to bring all that together was right. such an incredible learning experience. The thing about P and G again, 25 years there. It's such a big company. At the time, the way it was structured, you have a lot of support. <laughs> you have all this corporate structure. So there are things I uh, come, came to realize I felt kind of sheltered from the real world. And when I came into this role, the real world was right in front of me. The level of granularity I had of the P and L drivers. Uh, granularity and, and ownership like really of getting, those. Getting your hands dirty almost, right? Really getting my hands dirty. Yeah. But things that I just took for granted that were <laughs> supported in. I had to figure out how to get that done. 
So it was very, uh, you asked like, how was that? I would say it was dynamic, exciting, and personally growthful. It's like I busted the bubble. I got out of that right. safe haven of all of this support that a big company like a P&G provides, rolled up my sleeves, and really got to create a new company. Um, you know, as a president designee. Almost like a startup, and, right? Almost like you jumped into a startup in many ways. That is so astute of you, Matt, because at the time, that's what it was called. We said it was like a, a, a startup at scale because it was yeah. a startup. It was building the infrastructure, connecting the dots and the wires to make any kind of merger work. Usually when you do an acquisition, you're integrating a company into a platform. This was a merger of equals. So you're creating, there's no predominant culture. So it was really, really exciting. It also, because P&G is promote from within, you're working with a ton of the same people all the time. Same kind of cultural right. values. It's like the sameness, same. It gets same. recycled from brand to brand, right. Yeah. I mean, there's diversity within that, but it's a lot of the same. This was the first time after all these years, I'm working with people from companies all over. People that we thought were competitors and like, oh, they're bad because they're the Like you get into the real world and like people are people. Working for all these different companies and different industries even because not only were we merging from the companies and like Cody had a history of people that hadn't just come from Cody, but we hired from other companies, let's call it a Mars or you know, a craft or not even from CPG. So it also burst at the bubble, if you will, in terms of like working with a whole new diversity of people. And that was yeah. also so growthful. And I love people. I love people. So it was uh, personally energizing. Yeah, I mean, it's, I led a merger of equals before. The other thing that you have to deal with is just there is a, a, kind of this element of ego and, well, I'm a VP and you're a VP and who reports to who and how do you choose? And, oh, you can't just choose the people from your old company. You have to look at the other people. And it's not easy to manage all that when you're trying to move quick and actually have results at the end of the day. And my leadership team was probably a third, a third, a third. Right. From new people, from legacy P&G and legacy Cody. So we got to frame, looking at what was meant to be the new company values, um, how we would work and really get the most out of everyone. And that was such a help for me. And you know, you know, now working for Unilever, which um, historically was thought of as a P&G competitor, although in makeup Unilever never played, it has been such a gift because I work for so many different people. I'm not just that P&G person. I'm not. I, I have the ability to connect with different cultures and use different, you know, not just the P&G framework. Here's a recommendation, the three points to support, you know, strategy for, I can flex between yeah. that. I can use that and bring that, but I can flex to execution, 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 to collaboration and trust and relationship. So I learned that in that role to not just use the P&G shtick. And that's the risk when you stay at P&G a really long time, you can get really good at one way, right? Yeah. And so having enough experience that you're versatile. And you know, the best leaders have versatility in style, some consistency in the core, but some versatility to adapt to different situations. So I loved my training ground at P&G, but I'm grateful for the time that I've spent outside and it's helped me be a better leader and has been incredible um, in the, uh, you know, coming to Unilever, which has been just probably the highlight of all the places that I've worked. I've probably enjoyed my time here at Unilever the most. And I'm really excited to dig into your role at Unilever. Before we do so, I just the one other thing I saw just in terms of your background is there was a gap in in you know in between your 25 year career at P and G and and Unilever. You decided to take an, a, a sabbatical sabbatical for eight months. Um, was that a hard decision to take? You know, you mentioned that you have two children. Was that you know what was driving that decision? And I guess would you is that something you'd recommend to other people as they're making a career transition? I am so impressed, Matt. You have done your homework. <laughs> You've done I, I want research. all of my amazing team at Susie. <laughs> I would say the short answer is yes. It was a very hard decision to make, and it uh, there and it was probably one of the best decisions I ever made in my life. 
There's two, if I look professionally, incredible decisions I made. One was to live outside of the US. I spent eight years in Switzerland. Amazing, and I was so scared. And the second was leaving Cody to take a sabbatical and not go straight into another job and take a break. Right. And there's a few things I would say about that, and I'll talk about the sabbatical. I learned from that a distinction that I use of knowing when to say yes and when to say no, which is a really tough thing from, uh, that had been a tough thing for me to do. And I've learned to say yes when I'm scared and to say no when I'm clear. Interesting. And the times I've said yes, I've been so scared, not knowing what was going to come next, and they have been incredible. Moving to Switzerland. That's where growth is, right? You, that's, that's where the growth the is, is, going to the unknown. Yeah. You know, I was pregnant. I hadn't told anyone that I was pregnant because I don't think I knew when I said yes to the job. I was expecting my second. I accepted the job before I knew, moved to Switzerland, I had to take a maternity leave. It's like a new country, you have to have a baby, I don't know the language, a wow. new culture to start up. I was so scared. I remember telling my parents and my family that I was moving, holding back tears. Everyone would say, I'm so, you're so, you must be so excited. You're moving to Geneva. Oh my God, so great. <laughs> and I'm like, oh my God. And then my right. sabbatical. You know, after having gotten appointed, to be into such a big role, uh, which I was surprised that, that I was even selected. I was, you know, one of two Americans on the leadership team at Cody. Um, I was one of two women, and I was the only American that was a commercial leader. The other American was, was in R&D. So I just assumed they weren't going to select me, and when they did, it was a big appointment. And then to leave that appointment and take a sabbatical, like, I was afraid. What would the world think? Maybe they right. would think that I failed. That's what if what I, I never did? Right. You are, you're a high gear professional that's accomplished a lot. Like, I can imagine you thinking, well, am I going to just be disconnected and come back in? It's going to be hard for me to reenter. And am I going to never do anything again? Is that going to be the right. end of mine? But why I decided to just take a break was because I was on this corporate roller coaster. I've been doing that for more than 25 years. Go, 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 go. I was living outside of the US. I traveled 75% of the time. I'd wake up sometimes in Tokyo. Where am I? Wake up in the Middle East. Where am I? Go, go. I had two children at the time. I'd had my kids. I'd see my kids on the weekend. I just, that was never the plan, but just life happened. And I needed a yeah. reset. You know, I needed a reset, so it was a massive time out. And why it was amazing as I set out four goals, really probably because I was afraid that I would not use my time well. One was I was moving my family to New York that summer. So one was to get my kids settled and launched in New York because one was born in Switzerland. The other moved from, New from the States when she was three. So they need <laughs> she had to get back into being into America. The other was to get to and run a marathon. So I did that, I trained for the marathon, which I think, again, I did that because I wanted to accomplish something. Three was to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up, <laughs> where I would want to work, but not with like the pressure of finding a job, just the inquiry and the reflection. And, a being, and the part of that was finding my purpose and to figure out what I wanted to do next. I was even open to it being non-for-profit. And then the other was to rest, which was to sleep. And I did all this. <laughs> which everybody needs. Right. And I did all those things except for the sleep because it was meant to be an 18 month break. But I ended up coming off of the break because the Unilever opportunity came up and I wasn't looking for an opportunity. I wasn't. And when I talked to Unilever, it wasn't like a job interview. It was more, and when I approached my job interviews, I wasn't being interviewed, I was doing the interviewing because my mission was what do I want to do when I grow up? Learning about industries, learning about other companies so I could figure that out. And I ended up um, with an aha when I really went to a workshop to articulate my purpose. I thought, oh, I can do that here. So the first few times I was like, no, I don't think this is going to work. Why would I go to Unilever? I worked for P&G for 25 years. Why would I do that? Then I had, the, aha, this is exactly what I want to do, which is use my experience and beauty. My purpose uh, I articulated is inspire, inspiring our greatness through beauty, confidence, and well-being. And I saw this amazing, beautiful beauty portfolio with the brand Dove, 
with Shea Moisture, with brands like Axe, and so many others that I could use to certainly, as a leader, grow the businesses but create more impact. And so um, I ended up here out of that. Like that was an intentional choice to have a platform to live my purpose. And I had never defined or articulated my purpose before that sabbatical. Absolutely. I mean, w one interesting point I just have to just pull back out of, of what you just said. There's so many great nuggets there is that when you interviewed for Unilever, you were the one asking the questions. And I often find that the best employees I, we end up hiring are people who ask me more questions in interviews than I ask them because they really want to work at this company and they want to learn more about it. They're not just looking for a job. They're looking to be somewhere that aligns with their purpose and they want to know about the culture and so many other things. I just think that's a great point that I never – I never articulate that way in my head is that you should be the one asking questions, not them if when you're in an interview, if you really know what you want. So I think that's yeah, just awesome. Did, I just want to say know, that. And, and, and I knew Unilever through the lens of P&G and then through Cody. Right. So I didn't know. And I was meeting people. I'm like, these people are amazing. Are they for real? Like I was yeah. high because I had a different view and I got to see all these incredible purpose driven leaders. Purpose driven is kind of like, yeah, purpose driven, but like people that were deeply committed to growing the business and having an impact and seeing no trade off between those two. And so I saw, wow, this is an incredible platform where I can use my experience in beauty and evolve what was their personal care beauty business into growth pockets of beauty, really right. driving growth and using that to create impact beyond the products themselves, which in turn creates more product growth. And that's, you Absolutely. know, and, and there's so many examples of where Unilever does that. One that's kind of timely now, which is a Super Bowl. I don't know, have you seen any of the work on Hellman's? I've been reading about it. I have not seen the work yet, but we'll have, I'll have so, to check it out on YouTube you know, right after like, this. And, you know, and I've been doing uh, beauty work, but I think it just perfectly illustrates what the philosophy is. It's like Hellman's. You'd say, what is a mayonnaise? What is AC talking about mayonnaise? It's like Hellman's, its promise is all about make taste, not waste. What that means is we have so much food waste in this country. Like how much stuff do we throw away? Yes, we have yep. leftovers. We overeat with so much we throw away. And so what we would love to do is – throw away less, but we want to eat food that tastes good. So if you use Hellman's and the mayo, great tasting. You can make all sorts of amazing things. So there's a Super Bowl ad. You've probably seen it year over year, but out of this promise of make taste, not waste, you find ways to use more mayo, which is sell more, which is what we love to do because you have new uses. Help the planet because you're finding new ways to reduce the waste and build a brand because you do so in a way that's entertaining. So last You're year, you're also Super helping your Bowl, consumer save money in a, in a you know in a market downturn as well. Ooh, able I love to do that. More that's another themselves. benefit. You helping yep. people save money, and then you're exactly entertaining right. people because you see. You know, last year there was Mayo, the football player, like tackling people who are wasting food. This year you will see Ham and Brie that are found in the super in the fridge. And then they it make a ham and brie sandwich with mayo um, it, in a very entertaining app. So I hope people yes. are able to watch that. It's about that. unlocking it, a deeper, yeah. deeper brand purpose. And that's where storytelling lives, right? Ultimately, it's got to go beyond the product or service. It's like, what is the brand equity pillars? What's the core tenant of it? And what's the story that consumers can sort of associate with coming out of that? What's the story that drives that, it, that you have the right – to own as your brand, because not every brand has the right to tell the same story. It's back to your, your promise or your equity. In that, how does that drive growth? Because we're creating value for our enterprise, which is a part of what we do. And how are you making an impact on people? You know, you start with this, you know, I'd like to talk a lot about human centricity. You find out what people need, and then you match that with the business need and what the planet needs. And then you can create something beautiful when you find what is unique and ownable for that brand. And I use the Hellman story, mostly because it's timely and it's Super Bowl, so it's top of mind, but it's to illustrate right. how there's no compromise between growth and impact. And that concept is where I saw, wow, wow, 
what a candy store or a playing ground to contribute on the beauty and personal care brands, which we've done on Dove, which I've had a chance to do on Chamber, like so many examples. That's where, you know, Dove co-founding and championing the Crown Act comes from. Like what are people's needs? What do they need? We all want to feel seen and feel beautiful. But today society doesn't have us all feel that way, right? right. It, if it's because of shape or size, if it's because of um, gender, or if it's because of um, ethnicity. And you know, black women in particular say this is a definition of beauty that's in America doesn't look like me, not my hair, not my skin tone. And by the way, when I'm told that I can't wear braids when I go to school or I have to change my hair to get a job, it just perpetuates that. And so, you know, Dove, one of the brands that I joined Unilever for, where I saw the opportunity, has been championing beauty inclusivity, beauty inclusivity. And it's like, okay, that's incredible. And how can we serve underserved consumers, black women, more deeply as a part of that beauty inclusivity purpose, campaigning for real, real beauty? Let's understand what they need, what we need, I shouldn't say the, what we need, and how can we make a difference? in that, that our brand uniquely stands for. And we saw, you know what? We can change, we can be a champion for making it illegal to discriminate against um, women, men with textured hair, uh, saying that they can't, kids can't enter school, adults can't enter the workplace, and that's where the Crown Act came in, creating a respectful open world for natural hair. And just last week, we now have 20 states have pa who have passed a Crown Act or legislation inspired by it. The first one was passed in 2019. Like, that's the work. That's, that's what gets me excited. And, you know, Dove is one of the fastest growing brands. We've grown high single digits year after year after year through, uh, through this model and philosophy. Right. Of purpose and impact. And I think there's a misconception by many people in business that when you when you delve into the world of purpose, that has to come at the expense of profit. And what I'm hearing you saying is that a purpose and profit are intricately uh, aligned. They're intertwined together if you do it the right way, if you do it coming from a place of authenticity. Absolutely. And that's why I almost have stopped using the word purpose <laughs> yeah. because of the people's view that there's a trade off. And I view it as meeting people's needs. Right. We all talk about consumer centricity. I like to talk about human centricity. You solve people problems. That's what we do. And we solve people yep. problems through product, and we solve it through programs that drive impact. And that example of the Crown Act, example of Hellman's, is how we do that. And when we solve people problems, we drive growth. We drive That's growth, right. we drive profit, and when we drive growth and profit, we can solve even more people problems. I think it's so well put. So let's zoom out a little bit. So today, you know, you've been at Unilever now for five years, and, and you're now the president of uh, USA Unilever, as well as the CEO of the North American Personal Care Business. Very big job, but like when you break it down, what does the pie chart of a normal week look like for you? Where are you spending your time, and where do you lean in the most um, in this new wider role? Uh, I bet you know what I'm going to say. What I try to do is help people. <laughs> that's where I spend my time. Is helping In your people. organization, the people who work for you? Yes, that's how I think about myself as a leader is how do I help people. And so what do I do? I help people by creating clarity of strategy, meaning where do we go to grow? So in my role in personal care, it's spending time clarifying the choices we will make to grow and then engaging my teams in that to help them understand what success looks like and how to drive impact. And I spend a lot of time doing that. And then I help people identify resources and break barriers to deliver that growth. I help people by being a resource to brainstorm ideas when there seem like they're di dilemmas on I can do A, but I can't do B. I try to find the bridge between A and B to help people because, you know, the longer you've done something like this, the more experience you have to draw from to help people. So I, a, a typical day for me looks like a lot of helping people in different situations. In my role as head of the U.S., it's the same. I help our 
customer teams, our retailer teams, on how to unlock value for our retailers because you know growth is about creating joint value, making one plus one equal three, understanding our retailers' uh, needs and strategy, understanding ours at Unilever and creating plans and programs that deliver that and drive growth. So I talked to teams and to think about what my day was today. I spent time with you know two of the teams, uh, the retailer teams in that area. Um, helping people again, spending time with my HR partner um, who supports people um, for the U.S. on how we create an incredible employee value equation or proposition at Unilever, thinking through areas for that, how we reward people. So the thing I do every day is try to help people, and I show up in different parts of the business in helping people. And then I spend time with people like you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, that's not Very every cool. day. But, but that's a part, so I do some of that. I'm trying to think, what else? I'm reflecting on what I did today. I started at 7. Um, so many times I started at 6, but I started at 7. I've been back to back. My hardest thing is figuring out when to commute back into an office. Right, right. Because yeah, I started a lot of people so are struggling early. with that right now. Yeah, I start, so let's say, day I started at 7, our office opens at 7. I started at 7. I started before that, worked out. So I took my shower, got ready for seven. I'd intended to um, commute in for my 8.15 meeting, but there was something I needed to do for someone in between, and I lost my commute time. So that's the heart. So I took a meeting while commuting to manage my commute time. Um, and yeah, and I, that's when I talked to one of our teams. So Very cool. I hope that answers so, your question. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, it's, I think it's always interesting for people to understand that a day in the life. So for sure. So to wrap things up, I mean, we're obviously still very early in 2023. The world is changing so fast. You know, there's all this recent news about artificial intelligence. We're obviously in it's still an uncertain economic environment. So many things to contend with when you sit on top of a portfolio like you do. Of so many big brands have so much volume. Um, obviously, there's e-commerce and, and the shifts that that's happening, private label. What are some of the things that you have your eye on in terms of trends in the categories you oversee that are driving some of the strategies here? in 2023? Yeah, there's so much uh, opportunity is what I would say. And so thinking about how to lean in and expand our business to be fit for those trends. And so there are a number of them. The first one I would say is the wellness trend, the life, the wellness as a lifestyle and how it's evolved. And at uh, Unilever, we think about that expansion in a number of ways. One is the expansion of our portfolio. You'll see it's a lot in the uh, ingestibles space. You know, we've got brands like Ali and Smarty Pants and On It that are mm -hmm. all liquid ID that we've expanded. Our, we've created that portfolio over the past five years. Then in our core brands, really, in our core outside of that, evolving those brands into wellness. Um, you will have seen we've uh, really expanded into Bath and Body. We uh, co-created a brand with Target called Beloved. It's an extension of Love, Beauty, and Planet because we know during the pandemic, the bath and the bathroom was an escape. And so having yeah, a sanctuary, right. a sanctuary and a breath of fresh air and then the products to deliver that experience, that's been an incredible success. So we've really um, leaned in there. And there are a number of other areas of wellness in our portfolio that we've leaned into in our core. Um, you see it on our brand of and how we we think about wellness in terms of mind, body, and spirit, physical, skin care, and more. So that's been a big space. Wellness in terms of food. And I talked about helmets in the example. You see vegan helmets. You see so many other healthier, um, different versions of, of healthy for helmets. You see it in our ice cream business, playing in vegan, et cetera. So, you know, wellness is one of those big spaces. And then the other is community, inclusivity, and connectivity. I mean, that right. you've seen during COVID and even be before that, just a rise of activism and a rise of uh, people wanting to be seen, products that serve. And have a, and have a voice as well. Have a voice, yep. people having a voice, and making sure we have products and programs that service that are Shea Moisture brand, beautiful. We don't even call it a, a, a brand with a purpose or a mission. We call it a mission with a brand. 
and deeply serving the black community and black female entrepreneurs, there's an $11 trillion wealth gap today between uh, wow. from the black community and the average. And so we've invested, we're scratching the surface, but we are leaning in with, you know, we've invested $10 million in black women entrepreneurs and so many of the programs there. And then so many, so many products, you know, products for textured hair. Um, and when we think about inclusivity, we've done some work on degree, as an example, to help people with disabilities. You know, we had a product innovation called Degree Inclusivity to help people with physical extremity challenges. You know, deodorants is about confidence. And if you don't have access to deodorants because you have a hard time physical challenges applying it, so we experimented there. And now, actually, we have a set of accessories. We found there are different tools you need depending on your physical challenge. So we have an accessory kit with four. You can, tw if you, to make it easier to twist off a stick deodorant or pull it off. Um, and you can actually go to Degree.com, I think DegreeDeodorants.com, and order the kit. So you asked about growth space. I'd say wellness, inclusivity, diversity, activism are two that come to mind. And then obviously the third is tech. <laughs> you know, tech, 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 the digital revolution. I even hate to say that with AI, tech, data, et cetera. So that's another area that um, there's a lot that we could talk about there. But those Absolutely. are the top three I'd start with. Amazing. Amazing. Well, we're going to wrap with that. I mean, the energy that you have, the passion, the purpose is just really inspiring, I have to say. So I'm so excited to have had you on today uh, to wrap things up. Uh, is there one quote that you like to live by? You've ca you captured so many different mantras throughout our conversation today. Is there one that, you know, when your children get older and you're like, Mom, what's your one mantra? What would you tell them that, that sort of has driven uh, your career and even your role as a mother? So when you say mother, that's interesting. And I'm going to say two, because first what came to mind yeah. is trying to be someone else is a waste of who you are. That is my mantra. Trying to be someone else is a waste yes. of who you are. And you know, I believe it's Marilyn Monroe who said that. So, but trying to be someone else is a waste of who you are. So I am a big believer in doing you as you And not everybody, power. sometimes it takes people a long time to understand that. I think, especially in this world of Instagram and, 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 you know, FOMO and wanting to be other things, you have to get to a certain point of social and emotional maturity to say, you know what, I'm okay with me and, and that's enough. And the earlier I think people can get there in their lives, I think the more fulfilled they're going to be personally and professionally. Do, no one can do you better than you and that is your superpower and figure out who that is and that makes yeah. a difference and lean in. The other, my personal mantra, that's what I'd say to my kid, that is like it. But in that, my personal mantra is passion power. And it is around passionately making a difference in everything I do from who I am. So those are the, the so that's the quote and that's my mantra, passion power. I love that. Well, we're gonna wrap with that. Thank you so much, um, AC Eggleston Bracey from Unilever, um, our guest today. Um, thanks again for joining us. On behalf of the Susie Anatomy team, be sure to subscribe, rate, and review the Speed of Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. Until next time, we'll see you soon, everyone. Take care.